Hi, thank you, Aaron, for these super kind words. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, kia ora. Uh, we would like first to thank deeply to the New Zealand Institute of uh, Architects for this super kind invitation and unbelievably generous welcome. Uh, we have been kind of drawn to the, this kind of dramatic landscape of New Zealand for a very long time, and we wanted to travel for a really long time. But at the same time, we, all, we were also kind of um, fortunate enough to know one of your best designers, uh, Jamie McClellan, who introduced this kind of the potential of creativity of design of New Zealand. And then further on, we kind of embraced the creativity of David Trubridge through, um, through the light which we have in our kitchen. So by the nature of practice, architecture is unavoidably a consequence of certain existing specific conditions. And research and response to those becomes the ultimate generative tool of our practice. Uh, we would like to show today how this might be a possible route of practicing in a very specific, super small country in Europe. So coming from Ljubljana, we are a small architectural practice, mostly operating locally, but also with some projects uh, abroad as far as to Maui, Hawaii. And conditions in Ljubljana are very kind of tight. It's like uh, 350,000 population, a capital though. Um, but spanning from Roman settlement over medieval town and Baroque contemporary uh, city with a very nice introduction of uh, Plechnik, our architect national hero. We will present today our kind of the work of our practice, but this is just a kind of a slight um, collaborative work which we did with three other practices in order to define the shared space of uh, Ljubljana's main, uh, main street. So we structured the presentation on this particular point. So first we kind of define our positions, then we kind of define uh, the triptychs of selected realized projects, exhibiting architecture, experimenting homes, and improving society. And we end up with nanotourism. So to understand our current position, it is crucial to unveil the background somehow. Everything we create uh, is a reflection of who we are. Uh, cultural background, upbringing, education, uh, surrounding environment, all of this accumulates in us through time. And then we kind of, as architects, rethink it and we put it back to the, to, to the environment and society in a form of architecture. So as you heard after Ljubljana, that was this AA London agenda for two intensive years, which kind of produced this book, Negotiate My Boundary, which was, which was fundamental in our obsession that we would like to produce more books and kind of also see this as an architectural production or an architectural project. As you see, we haven't been working for others for a very long time. I was working for Zaha Hadid for one month and that was about it. And immediately, when we came back to Ljubljana, we started our own office with a small house that was featured on the first slide. So we actually learned all the, the mistakes of, of the trade by doing them. So after 10 years of having the office and, and trying to build as much as possible and compete on open competitions, we wanted to do again the research. That's why we started this ongoing research, nanotourism, which we will explain further. And then we were fortunate enough to start to work on a larger project in 2016 when we were invited to present Slovenia at uh, Venice Biennale. Currently, we are both extremely involved in teaching. I'm a full professor in Austria in Technische Universität in Vienna, and Alyosha is running this experimental program, AA Visiting School. So this is the way how we see uh, ourselves. Um, and the point of this kind of hand-drawn diagram is that uh, practice is constantly being intertwined with teaching and research, simply by pursuing the concept of research by design and vice versa, design by research. We tend to perpetually challenge the obvious. I think we were kind of uh, questioned about that at the AA, and we really try to stick to it and act beyond the standard, beyond the catalogs. We believe there is no standard situation and therefore there should never be a standard solution. So Slovenia put on a map like this, uh, it is on the crossroads of Europe from in between south and, and, and north and between east and west. 
And through history, we were part of um, political, very diverse cultural backgrounds, from Roman Empire through Venetian Republic, uh, Napoleonic, Illyrian provinces, Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, to this kind of social economical experiment of Yugoslavia. But nowadays, uh, our territory as Slovenia, it is uh, comprised of a two million population, which it's a bit smaller than uh, uh, on these two islands here. Um, so our cultural milieu doesn't really end up with our national borders, but it's somehow kind of here described as a five hours drive where you can reach uh, Florence, Milano, Munich, or Vienna, Budapest, Belgrade, or even uh, Split or Dubrovnik uh, in the Croatian archipelago. Uh, although this territory is a very small, Slovenia it is a very diverse country because it's spanning between the Mediterranean seaside towards the Alpine world on the north. We have had uh, a couple of years ago uh, an interview by the Detail magazine. Um, and the chief ed editor, Christian Stitch, was uh, pointing out that um, each project that we do is a unique response to a very specific context. Either it's social, material, historical, spatial, typological, or climatic. Uh, and these contexts are producing very diverse output. So therefore, there is no style, but rather a systematic design approach uh, our work, as you see here, spans different scales and programs, as well as very diverse climates and localities. And therefore, it's really important to understand each of these localities um, and try to develop a very subtle reaction within the codes of each of these contexts. Um, we, one of our very important positions is challenging materiality. We try to challenge the use of materials with exposing their primary nature. As Alyosha defined that uh, architecture is a discipline characterized by materials, it's somehow the opposite of the virtual, and we should cherish that and um, emphasize. But architecture in the first place is a process of thinking. And we see the sketch as a tool for translating this think thinking in some kind of diagrammatic mode towards architecture. But on the other hand, although the world is getting more and more digitalized, we still work a lot of physical models because we see this as an opportunity for discussion, discussion within the team, uh, discussion between uh, other people who are involved in a project, and eventually the discussion within a society. So we try to focus or build up our concept around users, about, around kids, residents, um, workers, whoever. So from social housing to museums, we try to place the user's experience of architecture and user's participation um, as our practice central objective. Uh, we try to introduce the topics of new collectivity, sharing and collaboration frame uh, to frame the social position of architecture, and we try to stimulate specific user experiences and trigger new social interactions. On the other hand, we were always drawn to this kind of um, low-tech um, and very specific understanding of sustainability, more as an attitude uh, and as a strategy. So at the time, architecture is oscillating between searching for eternity and experimenting in ephemera. If we pursue the enormous distinction between potentially super long-lasting and very, very temporary projects, we start to participate in ecological strategy. So what is long-lasting and what is ephemeral and what could be recycle-friendly? This is one of our older projects where we actually shown that we can actually do recycling on the site of metal waste. So we were very struck by this Icon magazine cover a couple of years ago, where we asked ourselves whether we really need to build so much everywhere. And uh, I guess the, in a way, answer is that we should build less, but uh, build maybe smarter. So we are defined with our landscape, with our language, but we are all defined also with our architecture legacy, the local ones. So we have been researching our architectural heritage from student years on, defined with the activism to preserve modernism of the 60s, 
um, and we have been doing this continuously to today. We understand architectural legacy as a knowledge base for experiment of the future. And as you see, we start everything with Joža Plečnik, which is similar to Alto in Finland, as the godfather of Slovenian architecture, and then all his pupils and the pupils' pupils. So, <clears throat> one of his most important works that those of you who have been in Ljubljana or are visiting, as I heard, um, you can explore is the National Library. Mo a lot of his work is in Prague and Vienna because that was the span of Count Ka Empire at that time. But actually this image shows this kind of the depth and the specificity of his architecture when he was somehow developing his very distinct position at the time that the very specific modernism, um, early modernism was going on in Europe. Um, of course, he was the um, pupil of Otto Wagner, and all his knowledge through Semper was kind of translated further on through Joze Plechnik, and through Plechnik to Edvard Raunikar, one of the most prominent um, uh, uh, architects in the 20th century. Uh, he was also um, not only the pupil of Plechnik, but also working in Le Corbusier's office. And therefore, he defined his own uh, re-understanding of this kind of contextual modernism. And he was able to be, as a very, very good professor, to educate very, very um, distinctive um, group of very experimental architects. So on an international scale, our reference is Peter Smithson. We were one of the lucky people who have met him in London, maybe doing his last uh, interview as students researching uh, the book Team 10 Primer. But through this interview that we've done with uh, Peter in South Kensington, um, we were abruptly reminded that, um, that um, uh, we should kind of focus in constructing instead of writing. I mean, Peter said that. He said, architecture is a craft. You can only become an architect by working in architecture. Academic work is what you do in your spare time. So he was drawn to do books, we are, but we decided to do our office. So there, now we are going to present in the format of the triptychs some of, of selected works of our office. So this is kind of a new format for us, it's an experiment. So we are going to go through exhibiting architecture, featuring three projects, but only one presenting in depth, and then showing you three distinctive houses, chimney house, compact karst house, and the Maui house. And then we end up with three public projects, um, and further on with nanotourism. So we tend to continuously question the role of architecture in an attempt to improve our society, regardless of the scale of our architectural production. Uh, recently, we were fortunate enough to readdress an important issue of how to exhibit architecture from very diverse, challenging perspectives. So from a major ret retrospective featuring the live research and architectural works of one of the most prominent Slovenian architects of the mid 20th century that developed this critical, experimental, but very human modernism, Stanko Kristel. Um, to Slovenian Pavilion at Venice Biennale in 2016, and then um, the third one somehow um, exhibiting contemporary design masterpieces as the, uh, at Design Miami Basel. So how to exhibit these super diverse materials? To have original drawings from the archive, particular selections of books, to major masterpieces like Tsotsa's monument-like tower, La Casa con la Bambina Chinese. Um, very specific features, um, dealing with um, very, very specific materials, and very different concepts in organization of the space, um, providing um, all the detailing, of course, to explore the identity and the materiality of those three projects. Now we go uh, in depth into home at Arsenale, which was maybe also one of the reasons we got this kind of invitation. So in 2016, um, we were invited to do this uh, pavilion of Slovenia or presentation. We are one of the luckiest countries, like you are, we don't have a pavilion in Venice. So therefore we understood 
that this is an invitation for us to design a pavilion, but we were at the same time also the curators. So we wanted, and we were super lucky, uh, to be able to respond to, um, to a very current pressing issues that uh, Aravena, as the Biennale main curator, posed. Uh, we somehow understood his call um, to somehow propose a project that would somehow help to improve the quality of built environment and consecutively people's quality of life. And therefore, we kind of, we were immediately um, drawn um, to the structures of dwelling because they predominantly built our built environment. So since the dawn of civilization, structures for dwelling have constructed the predominant part of our built environment, but we should somehow aim um, that they would become something more than securing mere survival and provide the conditions necessary for a meaningful life. We know that definitions of home have been constantly questioned and challenged within diverse historical and cultural settings, and we know that today's information-driven society uh, kind of um, pushed us to the proliferated, uh, proliferated mobility ranging from migration to various commuting scenarios. So what defines home today? Despite this growing virtual connectivity, the concept of home might still need a tangible spatial and social reality. And we wanted to question that with the help of others. So therefore, we proposed the concept of home as a public curated library dealing with the topics of dwelling and home. Um, so we, at the same time, we wanted to challenge um, the underused cultural institution, institution as Biennale Arsenale and further challenge this um, private public dichotomy which could occur within the institutions like that. How did we do that? So we invited um, uh, 26 uh, architects, artists, critics, and curators from various backgrounds um, to each to propose 10 to 20 book, books on the notions of home and dwelling in order to share their experience and their knowledge. We asked them um, to select very specific books from their fronts, from their environment, from where they come from, or from their, their expertise. Um, and we, of course, also asked them to select uh, a number of books which they could present their own work within the curated library. Um, so what we ended up is with 350 books ranging from architectural bestsellers as Poetics of Space to novels, for, um, to novels and books for children. In a forthcoming publication we are now working on, we reflect the curators and exhibit exhibitors' research and statements through the format of the interviews um, and through their positions of what homes might be. So this is the book uh, in the making. So this was the entrance to our part of potential pavilion, and this was kind of a lousy um, plasterboarded uh, half of a space in Arsenale. This was the context in which we wanted to do a site-specific pavilion. How did we do that? Of course, we were again trying to reference um, Peter and Alison Smithson since their project, Patio and Pavilion, uh, represents the fundamental necessity of the human habitat. So they were saying the first necessity is for a piece of the world, the patio, and the second necessity is for an enclosed space, a pavilion. So this is what you would need in order to dwell. So the patio and pavilion. The installation inhabited and reacted to the given space in Arsenale um, in order to, to react to the cutout of the window which we kind of created there. How did we derive that? The framework, the system of horizontal material ge geometry um, kind of reacting to the light, to the source of light, and then of course reacting to the fire definitions but also providing the, uh, the patio in itself. So what we have created is one-to-one -one spatial structure generated by a site-specific system of wooden bookshelves, uh, which performed as, as curated library, but also as an abstract home with living, bench, and entrance. This was very kind of parametric, um, parametric design in a low-tech manner, 
um, which um, this, the only ingredient was actually the bookshelf in itself. So these are a series of floor plans, which actually they change in each of the instances going upwards to define the cave. Sunlight was a metaphor for knowledge, is materialized in this wooden structure with the distribution and orientation of the vertical elements. So we created a pavilion that was created only for that particular place. We wrapped it, the main cavity, with all these 350 books, and we kind of inhabited the patio with objects of domesticity. So the, the pure structure of the wooden book, bookshelves in order to kind of create this specific um, definition. Why wood? Uh, the material definition of this installation is actually linking Venice and Slovenia because um, half of our karst region, which is bordering Italy, was extensively cut down all the oak trees in order to build the foundations of Venice. Uh, we couldn't afford the oak, but we still afforded, uh, it was still possible to do a wooden pavilion. Um, wood is also something that characterizes our country as 50% of Slovenia is covered with wood. As we like to play um, and actually test everything, um, because our structural engineer didn't um, believe us that this is um, going to perform, um, we somehow tested it one-to-one -one in Slovenia and then it was safe to, uh, to somehow develop it further in there. So logistic is a big issue in Venice. Everyone who was ever involved in doing a pavilion knows so. And of course, we wanted to do a one-to-one -one building and helping on the site, wrapping with the books, and actually characterizing all the invited participants to this kind of stack of books which are there. Additionally, we asked all the participants to, um, to, to kind of inhabit the pavilion for one hour or one day to kind of do the interviews there or any kind of uh, other events. So basically, we've, uh, through the six months of operating of this library, we organized a series of events, including the, the students' discussions, the, the workshops, and of course, the presentations and debate. Um, in this installation, which is called Home et Arsenale, reflects our approach to thinking and making architecture, underlining its social position, material manifestation, and architectural legacy, where the user experience and participation are our central objective. Either it's a collective social gathering of students or a very intimate um, experience of an unexpected uh, users, kind of kids of architects and all the other visitors. We incorporated our sustainability um, approach into the pavilion, so we are actually moving all the books and the pavilion to the Museum of Architecture and Design in Ljubljana. In addition, we are two hours and, and a quarter from Venice, so that's very, very short distance. Uh, as part of our contribution to the Venice Biennale, it was also an open source project, which is still live on our site, website, and it's called H, um, XH System House. Um, as part of our Avena call for sharing the knowledge, we decided to somehow um, to open a two years long project that we have been developing and now we have been sending all these kind of um, detailed drawings to the, prod, uh, to the spaces like Mexico, Spain, Slovenia, and abroad. So it's a do-it-yourself, customizable system, catering diverse needs, um, and trying to be custom whenever and react to the conditions in which this might be built. We developed 27 scenarios with very systematic uh, way how to build it, how to stretch it, with all the details that you are sent online. Experimenting homes. So the next section, which is uh, built work, we have decided to show you three homes uh, with a short introduction in comparison. And uh, quoting Maya Vardian, one of our friends, Slovenian friends, um, being involved in theory in architecture, um, she said that uh, the home might be the last field uh, for experimentation for architects. Everything else is already a uh, way to regulate it. So uh, three uh, family homes, uh, two 
recent houses from diverse context uh, in Slovenia and one on a remote location from the Slovenian context, which is on Maui. Um, the place, the site, the place, which kind of uh, derives the, 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 the knowledge of the locality um, with a very different situation and uh, kind of different context. Although the nature seems the same, it is completely different how it behaves. Uh, and of course, the references are also uh, quite diverse, um, which also produces a completely different take on chromatics. But uh, spatially, as these buildings kind of enclose homes, they all perform in a certain way, but uh, very different because they are relating to their users. And the spatial performance is also very important in terms of understanding how is the relationship between inside and outside. Um, and those are the people who have uh, actually produced these houses with us. Um, and precisely because of them, these, ones, th these specific homes are uh, written, uh, well, with their um, activities, what they do and how they live their lives. So uh, at the end, the material aspect of each of these homes is very uh, emphasized and quite clear in what it produces. Um, in the detail of exploring all the possibilities of every uh, material used. So first we present the chimney. Uh, here chim chimney house. Chimney is an element of typological transformation of a barn into a house, let's say. It's a rural town village, very close to Ljubljana. And what this section kind of shows you is the obsession of our clients to actually cook. That's why the chimney became the generative tool. This, was like, this is like now in Slovenia. That was several years ago, but now it's all white and cold. Um, and here you see the connection between the reference of the bar, uh, the, the passion of, of the clients, and how we transform that into some sort of new typology of a new barn which actually performs as a house. A very specific house in which you can go through, in which the, the chimney and the light on top defines the organization, which you can see here. The very, very core, the chimney, the wrapping, and the empty space which kind of performs. It's a split level house, cladded in mono material, as you saw, and further on, kind of redefining the edge of the village. So going through um, or out on the other side, the church-like space we were able to create for gatherings as the main space of the house, the specific light conditions, and specific niches in which you can actually inhabit the envelope throughout. No, not everyone is uh, accepting the always bright um, bedroom, but our clients wanted that. Um, so through this very particular detailing, which uh, we try to emphasize the importance of the selection of the material, which we always do prior to conceptualizing any of our work. So in this case, it's, um, it's a spruce um, cladding, which is not um, burned, but it had to be oiled since, since our client didn't want to burn the, the wood, so this is still a pain for us. Inside, we were able to use the oak and we tried it to somehow reconnect it uh, with the structure of the concrete on top. So um, the detail provided um, very specific view and very specific conditions where the structure which holds the whole roof um, provides the identity throughout the house. So moving only 60 kilometers away from the previous house, we come to the Mediterranean world uh, on the Karst region where we have designed this compact home. Uh, in the context of a rural situation, but this time the village much more compact because it's uh, composed of small buildings and really squeezed together in order to protect themselves against the wind um, in a context of um, this kind of natural environment. Here you see the traditional way of building houses in the Karst region. It is uh, practically stone only, from walls to the tiles on the roof, including the water duct system, which, which removes the rainwater. Everything is out of stone. So in a way, it is kind of monomaterial manifest. 
But the other uh, identity from these old uh, traditional houses is they are very small in volume. Uh, because the life there, it was in the house, you are protected uh, from the nature, and when you leave uh, your life, you actually go out and you live in, uh, you leave it in a connection with, uh, with the nature. So we figured out um, this should be the concept of a small volume, which uh, eventually it's equipped with this kind of iconic lights, uh, but um, a kind of a mono volume also with uh, giving an opportunity for the view to the neighboring village. Structuring down this kind of open space within one uh, prototype home, proto, proto house, we have filled in with the smaller volumes that actually represent um, those spaces which are a little bit more intimate. So it's a very simple floor plan uh, being kind of open crossways and distributed program uh, through the other axis. And then on the top floor, simply two small volumes for the bedrooms with a shared space for playing or socializing. In the section, you can see the volume becomes uh, pretty much obvious with this kind of small house within the house pushed uh, above touching the roof. So um, being inside of this home, it actually gives you the impression of uh, having a total view for uh, to total control of whatever is happening within the house. At the same time, referring to the outside, where you see here is one of those buildings uh, that we have referred to. The staircase is always an opportunity to also do, in a way, a sculpture or um, another additional added value to the space, uh, where here doubles as a library uh, for the low, mini home office. And then when you come up uh, in this kind of shared space between the two bedrooms, you understand that your small bedroom actually equals uh, the same uh, shape and uh, idea of your house. So this is how it sits there on the karst region um, in a contemporary way of uh, what the material is um, applied here uh, from a traditional context. And if you remember this, the roofs are actually being made out of platy limestone. And this specific stone, it's not allowed to, to harvest anymore. It is prohibited by law. So we decided to kind of figure out a contemporary way of uh, retaining the, the specificities of such a roof, but doing it uh, out of concrete. So we kind of made a lot of tests to understand how it works best. And then we added on top of the hydro insulation layer another concrete slab, which um, ended up uh, being the roof. Um, another reworking of a traditional um, dry constructed uh, stone wall, we have uh, done these facades with a traditional way of, um, of putting uh, the, the concrete in a formwork, but combined with stones. So in that sense, you kind of get the stones which are a little bit kind of recessed from the surface of, this, of, the, of the facade, but always using those stones that we have derived from the building site. So um, that's now, in a way, the contemporary version of a monomaterial stone house, which represents outside uh, itself to a harsh, let's say, environment, but the inside as being warm uh, home for this four members' family. Cliff Top House in Maui, it's actually the oldest project which we are showing today. It's from 2011. Um, at the beginning of our practice, we were fortunate to be invited by a um, best friend of my brother to design a house in Maui. We just started the office. Um, and then, therefore, um, we learned a lot about Polynesian culture, about the Pacific Ocean, and therefore we somehow tried to understand the landscape of New Zealand from that perspective. We couldn't design anything until we actually landed there because that's so different to anything which we were ever exposed within Europe. And then just the site comparison to what we've seen before, it was just kind of pure rough nature, which you are so familiar with, but for us that was like the other world. Um, after we traveled there, we kind of, and also from getting the brief from the clients that they want to have from each room the ocean view. That's why they wanted to live there. Um, and of course, then we somehow came up with a very, very simple solution um, to somehow do a series of small houses under a common large roof in order to provide 
um, the shade in, in order to provide all the necessary outdoor um, places for the house itself. So this is on a rough, windy coast of Maui. Um, it's actually uh, not very much populated because it actually it's not touristic or um, it's actually defined with the ranches of the Portuguese um, families which have been there for some time. So for us this was totally new and the only thing we got before seeing this kind of context of half blue and half green was the Walker House in Carmel um, that our clients referenced as something that they think it might be a good um, house to live in. For them, it was important that it ha didn't have orthogonal um, geometry and that it was done purely with the natural materials, and we try to embrace that. So there is a reason why your European lives on Maui, because he's a chief designer of Neil Pride windsurfing cells for more than 10 years. So they wanted to build a house, which is more than a family house, it's almost a venue. So this was the first conceptual model uh, of these small houses, and this was these U-shaped spaces, which they are ensued um, bedrooms facing the ocean, and the, the big one in the back trying to be first the garage in, he, in which he would like to repair his old timers. That was, um, so the roof was the main feature of the house. The structurally, uh, from the landscape perspective, it was kind of the uh, new topography that would allow to hide uh, the project within this pristine nature. This is far the biggest uh, house we ever did. It has 250 square meters because all the previous houses Alyosha was explaining and me, they were 85 square meters and even less. So this is kind of half of the house. It's covered with the roof, 250 meters and 200 meters inside. And as you see, um, the roof becomes a new, a new place, a new deck, a new terrace on that particular space. So this house actually performs like a mini hotel or a large home because they invite, being so remote as you are, they invite people to stay at their place for a very long time. So they're also super um, generous in that. Um, the, the large roof was primarily in order to not to use the ocean wind in order to somehow avoid air conditioning throughout the house. And of course, the connecting with the landscape, um, all the systematic approach of all the elements, the constructive efforts, um, which we were not so present at because it's really far for a construction site. So this is how you perceive it now when you arrive there. And from the back, you are really able to see through in order to see the ocean on the other side. Um, the front deck allows each of these rooms to interact uh, with the landscape um, in front. And of course, to meditate for why they are living in such a remote place. The chromatics, which we mentioned, was really crucial for us to somehow, they didn't, they, we wanted the house to blend in with the landscape when we tried to achieve that, also by selecting these materials. This is Ipe wood, very hard wood, as you are probably familiar with, that actually complete, it's completely different when it's exposed to the um, outdoor conditions as indoor, it remains really, really warm and dark. So all the materials used in the house that are just natural oiled, and especially in this kind of mortar situation, which we developed custom here as well, we somehow tried to develop a specific technique. Our clients were very, very proud on the fact that there are no paints used anywhere in the house, and all walls, um, all walls are covered by custom-made stucco mixed from white concrete, coral sand, a dune sand, and lime. So we, can, we found someone who was able to do that and actually it performs really well over the years. We were also super happy as European architects working in that climate because we didn't need to do insulation. So inside and outside was actually seemingly going through the, um, um, was, we didn't need to do the thermal problems. So these are the spatial, uh, spatial uh, features that we somehow uh, arrive to. Our clients are kind of extremely like to cook as well, so they, we did the kitchen with the ocean view for them. 
and in order to contemplate um, with Haleakala on the other side, the, the, the roof becomes the, the main feature. So this kind of super, I think it's nice to see that it's, it's not, you cannot uh, find it immediately. You see mostly the green grass and not the house itself. But we were kind of um, surprised when actually we realized that we are European architects building America the beautiful. So next section, moving up in scale, public buildings, which are um, a necessity, an opportunity for architects to impact society, to uh, improve society with our work and um, research on how to rethink what the public building is. So quickly, uh, we have here in comparison three very different buildings which differ in terms of program. One is a cultural center, one is educational uh, a building, and one it is uh, industrial recycling uh, building. Again, very different contexts, um, but also very different set of users, where somewhere the people are featuring the main, uh, com the, the main content of the building, but on the other hand, the waste metals are much more important. Um, references which are uh, defining the decisions we have taken at the beginning and uh, concepts that vary from creating the community or understanding the growing campus or uh, storytelling of a, of a recycling building with its own uh, architectural um, uh, layout. Um, the interior is always uh, something um, special in relation to the activities that the users are doing. And of course, uh, those elements that go to the outside of the houses are represented in a very distinct materiality. To um, show in depth the, um, the student campus, Livade, in the Mediterranean part of Slovenia, which I think here is obvious with this picture, um, you have to understand that we have um, acquired all of our uh, bigger projects exclusively through public competitions. So that, that was a competition which uh, it was more than 10 years ago um, for a campus that we have proposed as an organic uh, growing structure. Um, with a head building where the main library would be, faculty buildings, and then on, the, on one side also the student housing. So as our government uh, works very slowly, up till now we were only able to realize this particular building here. Um, and it stands there in its kind of anticipation of the whole campus, but we're still waiting for do that, to do that. But kind of made um, in a reworked Mediterranean um, understanding of space uh, with two entrances, uh, with kind of a split patio, half patios. Uh, with a central uh, communication area with a double height uh, communication space um, and the two lamels or slabs uh, where the program is distributed. But the most important thing is that uh, public could actually go through this uh, faculty building which is simply just kind of trespassing the, the, the public areas of uh, this research and educational uh, facility with of course some views to the, to the sea. So it is kind of represented itself through this uh, green um, underdeveloped area as a shell with a very regulated and small buildings, uh, of course, looking away from the direct sunlight uh, in order to provide certain quality of light within. And then uh, on the other side, a completely different situation like fully glazing uh, facade surfaces facing this half, uh, two half patios. Um, entering the building from uh, the part of the town, um, being part of this kind of vertical communication, um, communication area at the center of the building, we um, proposed the educational facility to be completely transparent within because we firmly believe that the re different research groups cannot actually make any substantial development unless they collaborate with each other. And visual communication is something that we as architects could give them in order to enhance their, uh, their uh, communication and collaboration. Uh, with corridors where you face uh, all of those uh, seminar rooms and, uh, and uh, laboratories um, being connected in uh, 
in unison uh, into a set of uh, social spaces that are also part of this building. So since this is a uh, research and educational building for um, natural sciences, we invited a Slovene artist to be part of that, and he collected uh, different kind of measures that uh, was kind of uh, bringing in a graphical manner to, uh, to, the, to the glass that actually distributes or, or divides the, the, the common areas uh, and the laboratories where you still uh, see through, but your site is somewhat mediated with this kind of art piece placed on the glass. Um, ending up with, um, with uh, lecture halls where we brought in the local um, oak uh, tree being part of, uh, of the conference rooms that also provide the necessary smell of the Mediterranean context. So the, the other, uh, let's say, industrial facility is the metal recycling plant that you saw what the future of that particular building could be on site recycling. So actually it looks like that at the moment. Um, or at the time when we produced it, it's in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's neither the, the nature nor the industrial zone. But what was interesting that we learned very soon in our um, practice that sometimes buildings are not the most important because here the plateau is far bigger than the buildings themselves. So there are two tiny little pieces on actually um, locked on the wall, on the perimeter, on the boundary of this waste metals plateau. What we haven't realized prior to that, is actually that they are going to be even less important once the recycling waste uh, hills are actually occur occurring around them. But it gave them a specific uh, landscape context in which uh, they are hidden, but they perform. So we wanted to be, uh, it's industrial, it's heavy, it wanted to be heavy metal, but we wanted to do it um, a little bit of poetics. So somehow to develop the two same volumes, but being distinct. One volume totally out of concrete because it's going to be long lasting, and the other one, which has more flexible office um, program, totally out of metal. So basically what we had to do is to develop this kind of office volume and wrapped it with the steel mesh in order to provide solar but mostly physical protection from the metals flying in. Um, and on the other side, we defined the service volume, which is actually just hooking on top of this really, really large concrete wall, which is defining the plant in itself. It was important for us in both of these projects that the structure and the facade are the, from the same material. So this obsession with monomateriality came also very early in our practice through this project. This project was actually triggering um, some issues in order to how to define uh, the wall in itself and how to define the roughness. This is not a Swiss concrete, it's super rough, um, but it has to be that. So all the imperfections were a part of our story. So the last and very special building that we are presenting here today, it is a um, cultural center of European space technologies. That kind of sounds very ambitious, but it was uh, initiated by an artist who wanted to promote a very specific person from uh, Slovenian history. Uh, this is the building that we have done in a collaboration with three other architectural offices that are all also couples. So you can imagine like eight people working together, but we somehow find the structure. Um, being placed in an in a inland, on a hilly uh, landscape of Slovenia, uh, where you have a very typical Slovenian village with a church being part of the main center of the village and then all of the houses being uh, uh, placed around it. So uh, the building has been positioned in Vitanje because that was a place where the family of this person uh, was originally from. So Herman Potocnik, with the nickname Nordung, was an Aust well, Slovenian national but Austro-Hungarian rocket engineer and pioneer in cosmonautics. And um, while being part of Austro-Hungarian army in ballistics, 
he also wrote one uh, book which was titled The Problem of a Space Travel, The Rocket Motor. It was first published in Berlin in uh, 1929. And in this book, he was addressing a set of issues how humans would travel in outer space. This is one of the first books that addresses the space travel from a perspective of uh, science and technology instead of imagination, as we know uh, certain literature from before. So he kind of designed the rocket or calculated how the trajectories would be and even designed certain architectures being part of space. Um, of course, also a heat pump, how the um, you know, architecture in space would actually be uh, sustainable. But most importantly, um, this is um, a space station where humans could actually survive. And as one of the most important um, uh, things that for, for, human, for, for humans is actually that we are constructed, our bodies are constructed uh, to sustain gravity. And this design, it is, um, it is a circular design which kind of rotates that produces in outer space artificial gravity and provides the kind of conditions to, for humans to actually survive in space. But um, besides um, this, well, this specific sketch had also a very strong impact in popular culture. As Arthur C. Clarke, when he was writing a, a screenplay together with Stanley Kubrick, for the groundbreaking film uh, 2001, uh, The Space Odyssey, which I'm sure uh, all of you are familiar with. They were familiar, he was familiar with the book of Hermann Potocznik Nordung, and they have used this design for the, well, stage set of uh, this movie. But the building uh, being placed there um, had a double role. So the first role was to perform as a local community center. The local community actually gave up their original uh, um, cultural facility in order uh, to, to produce a place for this new building to be there. So that was one of very important things that this is a part of the local community situation. But the other thing, it was this kind of space cultural program. And it's run by uh, a set of people, artists, who are putting forward quite an interesting preset of outer space. So up till now, the outer space has only been used for two purposes. One is commercial and the other one is military. So what they're saying is that we should also see the outer space as a cultural entity. So they are speaking about culturalization of space, mostly uh, within a discussion between artists and, uh, and scientists. So instead of uh, science, the focus of the activities in the building also uh, gravitates more towards humanities and art. So to walk you through um, this circular piece of architecture, uh, you walk in in, um, in a ground floor where the main round hole and its kind of foyer are strictly, well, strictly, they are belonging to the local community for their own events. But at the same time, when you walk uh, through this space and you enter up uh, in this situation of a wrapped space around the main cylinder where the exhibition is being um, presented, an exhibition of the space uh, technologies uh, as a tribute to Hermann Potocznik Nordong. And this, this space is um, inclined uh, spanning from the ground floor to the first floor and as you are circulating it, it never ends. Moving up to um, a floor just above the ground, above the, 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 the main uh, ground floor um, uh, hall, you find the spaces for researchers, like in their offices. They are running a program of researchers in residence where all different kind of activities are going on. But um, having a parkour through the building, the very important moment is while you are experiencing a very introverted building, when you're entering uh, the, the roof where you reconnect uh, to the nature. And instead of going back to the ground um, through the same path, you rather take the fire escape, which is orbiting down the building to touch the ground again. So 
the building has this kind of a, a very special situation in a section which provides um, the possibility of these two programs, local community and the research uh, entities of uh, sculpturization of space to be intertwined together and to have some kind of communication. With the situations like this when you look up or situations like this when you have uh, some uh, art uh, projects being there um, exhibited and performed. So the building as a cultural center, but as a community center, uh, it creates community, but it also inspired by community. And here uh, it happened something which was very interesting for us. After we have finished up um, the building and it was erected, uh, in this very small community of 800 inhabitants, it attracted the first year more than 24,000 visitors. So in this relationship, we saw an opportunity to make research and discuss what does uh, visiting places really mean and what is tourism. So we opened up uh, our research topic in terms of, uh, well, we, we called it nanotourism. So why tourism matters in the relationship to our environment? Today, the business volume of tourism equals or even surpasses of uh, oil exports or food industry or automobile industry. And over the decades, tourism has experienced continuous growth. It even didn't have so much impact through the financial crisis. So one of 10 jobs that we have in the world is a very important thing to understand how to deal with that. But, on the other hand, the most widespread product is mass tourism. And the model of mass tourism is always the same. Regardless of the local geographic, climatic, or cultural, uh, or social specificities of a specific place. And we can find this model uh, almost everywhere. I mean, from the Cote d'Azur in France to the South American coastline. And uh, facing this obvious problem of, of the model of mass tourism, we have remembered uh, American architect, innovator, thinker, Buckminster Fuller, who said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And with this in mind, we started the idea of nanotourism. So we asked ourselves, after decades of booming tourism, um, with wide impacts uh, to the territories and economic, economies all over the world, are there any smaller scale, non-intrusive way of visiting uh, or understanding uh, places? So that is actually not uh, something completely new. Um, that kind of understanding of visiting places um, already exists. Just think of uh, agrotourism, for instance, but they are not calling it yet nanotourism. So the term tourist is increasingly used pejoratively to imply shallow interest in uh, cultures and locations. You have an example from Venice. Uh, and we don't want to be tourists anymore. And we prefer to be called travelers, visitors, or simply inhabitants. So that's a diagram of what uh, nanotourism could be. Um, critical, participatory, responsible, local, educative, inventive, site-specific in a position of all of the uh, all of the counterparts to these uh, words. But if we would like to pick one, it would be, um, the, the, um, it would be participation. So in the old model, the tourism provider and the tourist are connected with one-way communication. But um, instead of uh, one-way observation, the new model of nanotourism is about participation and exchange. So participation is a tool for interaction and co-creation, where eventually the roles of a provider of a nanotourist and the tourist can, nanotourist and the tourist provider can also uh, swap. So at the end, if you want to put it in one sentence, nanotourism is a new constructed term describing a creative critique to the downsides of the conventional uh, tourism. So with this, uh, we are researching now tourism on very different platforms, and one of those is AA Visiting School Nanotourism, where we have been doing this for five years in uh, different uh, locations, but we had like three consecutive years understanding and researching the building of Xeut and relationship to Vitanie or uh, visitors that are coming there. And we know that, um, that um, 
cultural buildings like museums are very underused infrastructures. So it was very interesting for us to understand how this building can become something else and more within the context of nanotourism. So the AA Visiting School is one of the six segments of uh, the Architectural Association in London, and it runs on a yearly basis in more or less 60 situations all around, 60 locations in all around the world with a very diverse uh, um, um, programs depending on the people who are running it. And you see that in 2014, when we have started, it was a substantial shift in scale because it was like Seoul, Sydney, Taipei, Tehran, Tel Aviv, Tokyo, and then Vitania as a completely different scale. So uh, the visiting school nanotourism, it is something that tries to teach architectural students that architecture is not something that you draw on your table and design, but you have to actually work it on site and work with your uh, hands and understanding uh, materials. So we were calling this research design and make, um, and make uh, program. So through three years, we have uh, done uh, 16 different projects in different locations. Um, in student groups, every year like around 16 to 20 students. And let me show you uh, a couple, uh, three, uh, examples of student works of what uh, they have thought about nanotourism and how it uh, references to the building of Xeot. So uh, since the building is representing the idea of outer space and traveling of outer space, we have asked ourselves what is the common uh, that we have on the earth and outer space. And obviously these are basic human needs like sleeping, eating, drinking, and so on. So the first one was looking at the Xeut building. It was becoming a hotel in a way. Uh, understanding what sleeping is today uh, and uh, how it is done on Earth and how it is done on outer space. Understanding uh, the dichotomy between two-dimensional sleeping and introducing three-dimensional sleeping. I mean, we all sleep in two dimensions because our interfaces, beds, are actually just flat surfaces. But in outer space, there is a completely different condition. So providing this opportunity for somebody to actually spend overnight in a museum or in an exhibition, being part of it. But this is something that uh, quite a lot of museums are already doing on, uh, on a monthly basis. So the other opportunity was to see how you can suspend your body uh, by a structure that um, induces kind of uh, weightlessness or um, levitation. So we ran a couple of tests. Uh, I'm not showing here the whole process, just kind of bits and pieces, just to understand the feeling of how the architecture education is being run through this experimental school. Um, ending up in uh, understanding that uh, several small hammocks supporting your limbs would be kind of combined in one uh, system of pulleys that, um, that connects uh, parts of your body to be suspended in the air. So we created this kind of levitation suit that uh, uh, was suspended with this system into something like that where you could uh, you know, spend the night in a museum with a little bit of support by staff. Um, doing all these kind of crazy things, uh, inducing this kind of feelings. So moving on, we understood that we have to address how we feed ourselves, uh, how we create an opportunity for visitors or even inhabitants to understand, uh, well, to see uh, the food experience within the building, being contextual to the building, but at the same time deriving from the local uh, community. So duality of eating spans from feeding, which is representing nature, to dining that, um, that is culture. And those cultures are very diverse in different places of the world. So in outer space, you can still see that maybe we are just kind of being fed. Um, but on the other hand, we, uh, we have a, a dining culture. And we have invited uh, Micha Petek, the chef of a local uh, very uh, high-ranking restaurants to be collaborating with us in order to, to, to create this special experience. So obviously, in outer space, you don't have uh, any uh, dinnerware, so complete abolition of dinnerware, except for the napkin, which was something that we uh, took forward. So we produced these uh, napkins and designed a um, um, a scenario of how you dine in uh, Xeot. 
with all of the dinnerware being just a reminiscence uh, printed on the wall, the curved wall of the building. Creating the full menu, starting with an appetizer, and then uh, inviting the chef coming in, that's a mushroom soup, which is being applied to the wall um, with actual mushrooms, with a full uh, presentation. And then in the final jury, we were uh, happy to be part of the experimentation where we got our uh, soup <laughs> this way. With a sausage at the end uh, of the main course. So, and another experience of a similar situation is how we consume um, liquid, more specifically wine tasting, which is uh, in collaboration with uh, another very important uh, local, uh, well, tourism provider, if you want, uh, the, the, vine the winery is La Tigrich, uh, where we um, went there deeply to understand what is the traditional uh, ritual of wine tasting, which is kind of described here, but it's heavily dependent on one specific tool, which is glass. But as soon as you move on the outer space, the glass does not make sense anymore. So we were trying to see how the glass could be transformed uh, in that sense, being contextual to what is the discussion of uh, the Xeut Institute. So we figured out from this first prototype that could be kind of extended to the whole body of yours. Uh, in order to have a wine tasting experience like this, when you inject uh, a glass of Cabernet Sauvignon uh, into this, your system, and then kind of figuring out a choreography of uh, moving your body in a weightlessness situation to uh, finally achieve and have a sip very well aired red wine uh, for, for your enjoyment. So a contextual set of uh, projects that discuss uh, how you visit and understand spaces in specific situations. So maybe for the end, just an invitation. Uh, since after Vitanie, we have, went, we have gone to the north of France to explore another place like this, and eventually last year in Honolulu. And this year, we are repeating the Honolulu experience as well. Uh, understanding quite a lot of uh, very similar um, uh, situations as here, um, really understanding what aloha aina means and what is mana, and of course also honi that we have been welcomed with that also here. Uh, but the other location we are going to experiment this year uh, completely anew is, uh, is Peruvian landscape, uh, very high, like 3,200 meters above the sea. Uh, understanding how this, the, the, the local um, uh, specificities could uh, provide a very specific um, um, yeah, experiences for visitors and inhabitants alike. So thank you very much.